Welcome back to the channel folks and to another painting tutorial. Now the subject of this guide is an out of production V3 warrior team that Oberst Guzwich, if I've said that right. But this is a great tutorial subject folk because it covers vehicle painting, it covers figure painting and it covers groundwork. You know, so the sort of like the three essential parts of your Flames of War collection. So let's get started. Let's start with the airbrushed camo folks. Now I've given the vehicle and the rest of the base as well whilst I was at it a coat of dark yellow too from Tamiya and then I'm moving on to red brown once again from Tamiya. I choose dark yellow too over the original dark yellow from Tamiya because it gives a brighter finish, it's a lighter colour because what you have to remember is that we're going to be applying varnishes and washes and weathering to the finished camel which means it's going to darken down so I prefer a lighter start, a lighter base, overall base look. I always apply the brown camel splotches or in this case lines before I apply the green lines. Overspray is an issue no matter how accurate you are on a tiny little kit like this, you're going to have overspray. So I prefer the final overspray to be the green rather than the brown and that way it gets a greenish tint to the finished look and I do mean tint rather than a brownish tint. You know, so it's a little bit lighter than it could possibly be if I apply the green second after I've applied the brown, if that makes sense. I'm applying very thin lines here, but whatever kind of camo that you're going to apply, especially the first application, you have to bear in mind there's going to be another camo added. So there needs to be sufficient base colour, in this case a dark yellow, visible so that it's not going to get completely covered up by the camo, unless that is your intended look. You have to plan to make sure you get the right balance of all the colours. Airbrushing thin lines at this scale is quite challenging, quite frustrating and it takes a lot of practice. It's not something you're going to be able to just pick up and get right first time. Like even here for instance, I'm having to clean dried paint off the needle and that is quite a common issue. It's not necessarily something you will experience in every single session of airbrushing but it's something you have to be prepared for and you have to be able to detect when it's happening and know that you need to take some action. Even when you've got your paint working right, your airbrush working right, you still have to consider the camel pattern, you know, creating an attractive and interesting camel that matches the work you've previously sprayed on. So for instance, the green lines here are the same size and the same shapes, the same curves and such likes as the brown. So once again, takes a bit of practice. As with a lot of manual skills, you're going to have to build up muscle memory to be able to get the patterns that you want so you can create the shapes quite easily because you're going to need to move your airbrush in tiny little movements in tiny little areas because of the scale of the vehicle and you need to do that in a controlled way so that you can get a consistent look. Now you don't need to buy an expensive airbrush to do this folks. You may want to buy an expensive airbrush, you may feel more confident with one but I'm using a very cheap one here, it maybe costs about £20 or in my case I got it as part of a, a cheap airbrush and compressor package. The most important thing you're going to need above all else is the experience that you've built up through the practice so that you're going to get the right, the right airflow, paint flow and then muscle memory so you get the camo shapes that you're after. And incidentally, if you feel your lines aren't perfect, you know that there's maybe a little a uh, bit of softness, too much softness or too heavy at certain points, don't worry too much about that because we're not finished by a long chalk here folks. We're going to be varnishing, we're going to be washing, we're going to be weathering and that will soften things down nicely so that even things that maybe annoy you at this stage, they're going to disappear as you get further into the project. 
Here's a little bit of additional footage just to give you an idea of the amount of movement that you have to generate within very small areas on the figure and how important it therefore is to get the right flow of paint and air. Once the camo is completed, I've given the vehicle a light coat of gloss varnish. I'm not going to sit and spray it and spray it and spray it here, folks. I'm just going to give it a nice even pass all over so that I can then do the pin wash. The gloss varnish helps the pin wash in that the smooth surface allows the paint that we're going to use to have a nice even capillary action and flow along all the lines, the panel lines and joints and bolts and handles and such likes as well as making it easier for us to clean any excess wash off the nice smooth gloss surface. The most common type of paint used for pin washes is enamel paints and there are lots of ready to buy enamel paints out there if you want to go and do some research. I however am using uh, an acrylic paint, it's MIG Ammo Washes. Now I've chosen this because A I actually find it better than the enamel washes but that might just be a personal thing but secondly I'm a commission painter, I paint all day long. I could be doing pin washes for 8 hours in a day, working with an acrylic product is quicker, cleaner and nowhere near as smelly even if you're using odourless thinners nowhere near as smelly as the enamel product that I've used in the past. Pin washing takes a lot of patience folks, there's no way of getting around it. You can see how I'm applying the wash into all the panel lines and around all the features. I'm not just washing the surface and then cleaning it off. That is an option but it will darken things down even with the greatest stuff care and cleaning. I'm not working straight out of the bottle. I've prepared the wash to the consistency that I want just by adding a bit of water, very simple. And then clean up is once again very simple. Going to use a brush that's just a little bit damp, that's not going to flood the surface with any, any water, any liquid, and then draw off the excess or draw the excess into the areas that we want to shade. Because this is an acrylic wash we don't have to wait for the following day to start highlighting. It does take a little bit longer to dry because it is a specific pin wash that is designed to be worked after application but after a few hours you'll be able to start working around it. I'm going to approach the highlighting with the same level of precision, is that the word folks? Is that a bit too ambitious a word? But the same level of attention that I applied the pin wash. And this way we're going to help build up the contrast that we need to really make all the various panels and features of the vehicle pop. We're going to have the shade and then right next to it we're going to have a highlight which is going to create that contrast. Now I'm using Iraqi sand for the highlight here folks. That's Vallejo Iraqi sand. It's a light colour that's not too saturated so it creates a bright edge but not a bright as in someone's turned on a neon light kind of bright edge. When painting this highlight line, my intention isn't to just edge highlight all the areas. That's going to be something that's a bit too stark and strong. We want to create a highlight that looks natural but provides sufficient contrast. So you can see me almost bouncing the brush along the line at times, especially on the external edges, the ones that are most easy to work with. And this approach also starts the chipping process because chipping happens mostly on the edges and it's not something that is consistent along the entire edge of any feature. So using the map that I've created by highlighting, by the broken highlights, I'm now going to go in and start chipping the panels. And what I'm doing here, once, once again with Iraqi sand, is I'm breaking up these larger panels so that they, they have a bit more depth to them. And it actually helps focus a bit more, gives it a bit more shape.
This is a very simple approach to chipping, folks. You can do more sophisticated techniques such as sponge chipping and so on. That's very tricky because uh, you could easily overdo it. In general terms, you can overdo your weathering. It's, you know, perhaps a new approach, a new technique for you and you just start getting stuck in and enjoy it and do a bit more and a bit more and before you know it you've created something that looks more at home perhaps on a scrap heap rather than on the battlefield. So approach your subject a panel at a time, an area at a time and make sure everything is nicely in balance. Now you can see I'm also painting the interior here to try and give it a bit more definition. There's no real sculpting in there. I've just used some Iraqi sand to create these lines but I'm going to come back later on with some shade too because it just needed a bit more contrast to help create the shape I was looking for of all those planks. Now to finish off the chips to make them pop and once again in moderation folks we're going to use some German camo black brown from Fellagio and paint into the core of the chips. Very 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 thin black brown line to represent sort of exposed and rusted metal so these are darker chips. The lighter chips from the Raki sand is kind of like exposed paint and then the darker chips exposed metal. It's a stylized way of doing things folks but it really helps define all the work we've done with the chipping and then as a result help give the vehicle more shape, more contrast and more interest. So the windows folks, there are so many different approaches you could take to painting windows. You can be painting reflections off the outside world, you can be painting silhouettes off the drivers so many different things but here's a nice simple approach. First of all give it a nice solid coat, you probably need the two, two coats here by brush folks of German grey and that's going to be our deep shadow. Next up I'm going to paint what I suppose you could describe as dapples of grey over the top of that. It's a lighter grey and in this case I am using dark rubber. I'm using dark rubber because I've also used it on the wheels here and why not just use the same paint. It's going to look different uh, at the end of the day but we can save ourselves a bit of time by painting the wheels at this stage. But you can see I'm just creating dapples. Some of the paint is more opaque than others so that there's a bit of a, a, a broken look to it. It's not a solid dapple of paint we're putting on here. Then to finish off to get a bit of a glint on the window so to speak I'm taking a very light blue this is azure and I'm just painting some very small lines like three lines across the side panels two sets of three lines across the front windscreen and then just keep them all going in the same direction just for a little bit of a highlight to catch the eye and to add to the dappled look but 
and we're keeping it as simple as that folks a little coat of gloss varnish after the final coat of matte varnish will help them look a little bit more like glass next up all the storage that we've got on the rear of the vehicle and it's this storage that really makes the vehicle stand out against other kits you know that's what makes it unique so we're going to paint it in a way that makes the storage really pop I'm taking the same approach as I would take to painting my minis here, you know, like crew and such likes, as you'll see later on in this guide, by giving everything a coat of German Camel Black Brown. That kind of unifies everything to a degree in this sort of messy rear area, but it's really all about the external shade of all the items that are in there, so that everything is separated from everything else, which really helps define the shape. I will then layer up all the appropriate colours with the Jimmy Camel black brown as a visible line between each area. Now remember folks, it's going to take you a couple of coats to get this on nice and solid. We don't want to slap it all on one coat. There's a lot of recessed areas in here that could easily get flooded if we put too much paint in. For the camo nets, the second coat of shade colour is going to be olive drab. There's going to be a lot of the shade colour visible in the camo nets by the time we've finished so I'd rather it was a more greenish shade than a brownish shade. So when I'm painting the camo nets I'm not dry brushing as such. The brush is really quite wet but it's not too wet in that it's going to fill all the little tiny little depressions that are in the sculpt that are going to create the shape of the camo net. So I'm tapping or to a little extent drawing the brush across the surface but it's not dry brushing we don't want a dry look to the thing and the kind of colours I'm using are US dark green dark mud these kind of colours similar colours sort of muted greens but you'll be able to tell the difference between the finished areas after a careful highlight with colours such as green grey I'm going to pick out all the little bits of tape and ribbon that are tied to the camo net with some German Camo Black Brown. That's going to really help make them pop when I come back later on to add a little bit of colour to them. Now for the boxes in the back, there is so many different colours you can paint a box, but what I want to do here is make them stand out against the rest of the storage. You know, so all the different components of the storage are visible against each other rather than it being a big mess, which as in reality we want to see all those different areas so I'm going to use some bright colours with some high contrast here I'm going to start with medium grey and then I'm going to go on to a highlight on the, the individual panels with deck tan but I'm going to be leaving the the Gemma Camel Black Brown in between all the panels which is quite a stark look but it really helps define the shape of a small item within a larger area a larger busy area. For the rolled up tarpaulins I'm going to be using old wood as the main colour with a highlight of Iraqi sand and what you'll see me doing here is following the sculpt of the rolls so that I'm leaving a little bit of the German camel black brown shade to help create the shape and also around where the, the bindings are, the rope or the leather bindings. I'm applying the Iraqi sand highlight here and you can see at this point I've already painted in all the little strips all the little pieces of fabric that have been tied to the camo net and I've used uh, old wood for that so at the same point as I'm highlighting the tarpaulins I'll give a, just a little highlight to those strips with the Iraqi sand just to make them pop a little bit more. There are some smaller items on the back of the truck there, there's a spade, there's some poles which I'm assuming are for some kind of tenting. Uh, so I just use general kind of colours you may have seen me using on vehicles in the past here. You know the, the spade I'm going to be using greys, uh, going to be German grey, dark grey, London grey for the metal. For the wood it's going to be flat earth with a highlight of new wood. The poles I'm going to use German camo medium brown and give them a highlight of US field drab. Different colours all going together nicely with the German camo black brown defining all the shapes 
arriving so nothing is spilling into each other and the colours stand out against each other without being overly bright and overly saturated. To make the hinges stand out I'm going to first of all frame them so to speak by giving them a coat of black. I will then put a main coat of German grey leaving a tiny bit of that black around them to, uh, to help them pop and a tiny little highlight of London grey just to give them a little bit of a metallic tint. Here I'm going back to add a bit more detail to the, the bland and unsculpted interior of the walls of the truck. So as before, as you've seen, I added lines of Iraqi sand that's not really made it pop enough or given it any depth. So I'm going to use German Camel Black Brown to paint along those lines of Iraqi sand, paint right beside them as much as possible so that we've got some nice highlight and shade to try and create the impression of planking. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect folks, it just has to create an impression. So don't stress yourself out. You can see this is speeded up at twice the normal speed, but I am working quite quickly here and it's quite a nice effect at the end of the day without too much effort. Let's do some groundwork before we start to paint the figures that we're going to place into all these little holes that you can see. Now for this I tend to use Panzer Aces German Tank Crew Highlight. Now it's a brown but it's got a good earthy kind of colour to it as you can see here. So I'm going to paint this all over, it'll need a couple of coats. It won't be the final treatment for the ground and there'll be tufts and such like added to it but this is a really good starting colour for me. Okay let's move on to the figures. Now I'm not going to spend a hell of a lot of time showing you how I paint these guys because I have got so many dedicated tutorials for painting German infantry figures and I'm not going to be straying anywhere away from those tutorials when I'm painting the figures that go with this kit. These are unique sculpts but the colours are fairly similar to what you would find. There is no different kind of uniform that is visible on these that would use different colours from what you'll see on my other tutorials. So if you want to see that in more detail just check out the playlist for Flames of War folks. There will be still pictures at the end of this for you to have a look at them and I'll put a link in the description to a suitable tutorial for you too. So instead of the characters I'm going to show you how to paint the little trestle table that comes with the kit. Not that you might paint many tables in your time but you know there's, there's certain approaches here that can be interesting and useful to learn. This little table is such a classic to Flames of War if you played it before version 4. There were so many units that might have this in it, you know, artillery units and, and command units and so on. It's such a classic little piece of Flames of War history really, it's kind of iconic so let's see how I would approach painting it. I've given it my usual undercoat of German Camel Black Brown and I'm going to be using the layering approach to a degree here but with also some washing as you will see. The main colour I'm going to use on both the table and the radio is going to be old wood. Now you can see I have given solid coats across most of the table but I've also painted in some sort of planks, some individual planks within the table structure itself and then I'm also picking out the shape off the radio using the German Camel Black Brown there to frame the radio against the table and some internal detail on the radio too. After applying a second coat of the old wood I'm now going to give it a careful wash with German Camel Black Brown. And that's going to soften everything down so I can get a bit of a wood grain kind of feel to things. Note I am not applying the wash to the radio, I will paint that with a standard kind of layering approach that I do. When the wash is dry I'm going to go super bright but also super fine on some highlight lines. I'm going to use Iraqi sand here which on the wash surface stands out really really strong. That will help keep the, the, the overall appearance quite dark and grainy but then just help the shape of the table lift out and also give it a bit more of a wood grain kind of finish. 
the radio I'm going to be using Middlestone as my main colour. I like to use that for smaller items such as Panzerfaust, Panzerschrex. Now I'm going to layer it on top of the old wood, leaving some of the old wood as a shade. The highlight colour will be medium grey. It's not too strong or too bright a highlight but just gives it a bit of a lighter edge. And then I'm going to paint the straps with German medium brown, uh, camo medium brown with some highlights of orange brown, some very small highlights. And then the little book, I'm assuming it's a code book because there's a radio operator sitting there. Give it a black base colour, some white pages with a few black squiggly lines and that will create the impression, the satisfactory impression of a little book. And that's the table done folks, a nice little characterful addition to this very characterful objective or warrior team depending on which version of the game you are playing. Now to add a bit of interest to the ground without dry brushing for instance I'm going to use some pigment powders and you can see I mixed it up on a palette there so that I am getting a nice runny mixture. You've got to be careful with pigment powders folks. You think you need to add more because when you're applying it you can't see much but once it dries that's when you see it so you want to be able to add more it's a lot more difficult than taking away excess and pigment powders instead of dry brushing well these pigment powders are going to dry to a nice grainy earthy finish and that's really what we're after here folks rather than a, a dusty look to the ground now you can see i used a light colored pigment on the ground you could also use that same pigment on the tyres. I've chosen here though to use a dark pigment, that way I can shade the tyres, I can shade the hub. I can also shade the, the rubber, but you know that could, if you wanted, stand out quite strongly with the light pigment too. So you've got choices there, but here to keep things nice and simple, I'm just shading the tyre and the arches and so on with a dark pigment. Here you can see I have glued the figures in place. Now, normally I would apply the pigments to the base after everything was in place, but here it's quite tricky getting in behind all these figures, you know, between them and the Opal Blitz, so I've taken this approach. I super glued the figures in place. If they were plastic, I wouldn't need to use super glue. This product here would act as a filler and a glue. But in this case I'm going to be using it as a filler so carefully making sure I don't hit the figures though getting some on the boots is perfectly fine if it's not excessive I'm going to start filling in the gaps between the metal base and the resin edges the figure with the binoculars this is this one's a bit awkward here uh, first of all getting into uh, the rear area is tricky as you will see me struggling to do so. You just got to be careful here and choose the right tool for that particular job. Now it's also a very large cavity, shall we say so. You know that the filler is going to sink once you've placed it in. And you can then, once it's dry, come back and top it off. That can happen with any of the filling that you're doing here. But I am going to be, when it's dry, painting it with a base color again applying a little bit more pigment just so everything's a nice and even finish all over and then covering it in grass so any little gaps or uh, dips they'll all disappear so we don't have to do too much work here folks I'm also going to add a little bit of this filler to the base of the stool and the table legs on the little uh, radio operator there just to help keep that in place because it's not recessed deeply into the base itself like the other figures are. And then to finish folks, a little bit of static grass, which is a nice simple process to carry out folks. What I tend to do is place the grass around the base of the figure, that way that you're going to hide any visible joins between the figure and the surrounding uh, groundwork. And it also means that you don't have to try too hard when you're doing that groundwork to get things looking absolutely perfect. And then when I'm placing the tufts, I'm going to place them, setting them, especially on the far side of the vehicle, up against the dark underside, so that the dark underside is pushed back and becomes a natural shaded area. And it's not such a stark and strong difference between the vehicle and the ground. And you can see me doing the same kind of groundwork here on the 15 centimetre. 
classic objective marker. Now, that's us done for today, folks. The next classic I've got lined up already is the Barkman box set. So stay tuned if you want to see that. If you've not already done so, you might want to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you're going to definitely catch that. And I've got a few other videos lined up over and above the normal battle reports, guys. So we've got some nice tutorials coming your way. So thanks again for watching, folks. And hopefully I'll see you all on the next one.